The Caesar shift is one of the simplest codes we come across in cryptography. It's a substitution code, which means that each letter is replaced with another one. The code's named after Roman Emperor Julius Caesar, who used this method to send military messages to his army. To encrypt or decrypt the Caesar shift, we first list the alphabet, as we have done at the top here, and then for a Caesar shift of three, say, we would move every letter of the alphabet three places. This means now that when we write a D in our message, what we actually mean is A. When we write an E in our message, what we actually mean is B, and so on and so on. So each of these letters are mapping to a different letter of the alphabet. Now what's happened with X, Y and Z that sort of shuffled off the end of the alphabet over here is that we then write these back at the beginning, X, Y and Z. Okay, so that A becomes X, B becomes Y and C becomes Z. So there's a kind of a, a looping round going on in our shift. So, to write a message in code, say I wanted to write the word hello, and I wanted to work out what the code for that was, first of all, I'd find the letter H, and that maps to K, so that's going to become K. E becomes H, so KH. L, this letter here, becomes O. L again becomes O, and O becomes R. So what I would write in my message is K-H-O-O-R and what I would mean is hello. Decoding then just becomes the simple opposite of this. I look up the first letter K, so I would look at, look at that on the top line, K. What does that map to? It maps to H, so that's going to be H. Then I look at H on the top line, that maps to E, and the same with O and the same with R, so I get my message back. The crucial piece of information you need to know in order to be able to decode your message back is how many places was this lower alphabet shifted. So if I didn't know that, then I might have a bit of a problem. If I knew it was three, I could do the shift of three places and the whole thing becomes very simple. So what would happen if we received a message but we hadn't been told how many places it had been shifted? So here's our little message. If we don't know how many places it's been shifted, well, we could try all the different possibilities, which, if you think about it, although there are 26 letters, would mean we'd need to try 25 different uh, shifts to see what the message was. Um, and one of them, hopefully, would come up with something fairly sensible. Um, obviously, we don't need to try the 26th, because that would map each letter back onto itself, and in, in that case, this, this word doesn't actually make any sense. If we didn't fancy doing 25 different shifts, um, we could employ something called letter frequency analysis. Now this word up here, Eto in Schurdluck, and then whatever that says, which you can't quite pronounce, these are the letters in their kind of order of frequency within common English language. And what this means is that the letter E is the most common letter in the written English language. Uh, T is the second most common letter, A is the third most common letter, and so on. Now obviously, individual messages won't necessarily follow this pattern, but the idea is that you look at the message that you've got, you see which is the letter that occurs most frequently, and it's most likely to be an E. And if it's not an E, it would be a T. And if it's not a T, it could be an A. Now with such a short message as this, this is not, we haven't really got enough letters to give us um, a, a good uh, amount of frequency analysis to work with, um, and so in this case it wouldn't be the most efficient thing to do. Um, but if you had a longer message, the chances are that the most commonly occurring letter would be O, and uh, would be E, sorry, and in that case um, we can work out the, the shift to shift that letter onto E. So let's have a think about this. If E, if it was an E, that would have been shifted 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 places to become an O. So we would do a shift of 10, translate the message and see what comes out. Obviously, as I say, in this particular case, it's not going to give the right answer. So we would then say, OK, perhaps it was a T. So we'd see how many places T would have shifted to give an O, and we'd try the message shifted by that amount and so on. Okay then, let's see some uh, code 
breaking in action here. We've got this message at the top of the page. Uh, we're not quite sure how many places it's been shifted, but I've written down the letter frequencies at the bottom of the page. And we can see that X is the most frequently occurring letter, so we think that might be an E, and that would be a shift of plus 19 places if E was shifted onto X. Well, not far behind it is Z on uh, five occurrences, and that would be a shift of 21 places if it was an E. And sort of wrapping round, B also occurs five times, which would be a shift of plus 23 places. So in the first case, I'd try shifting my message uh, back 19 places and see if that gives me anything sensible. Then I'd try 21, and I'd try 23 to see if any of those work. Now in this case, when I tried a shift of 23 places, I shifted it back 23 places. This is what came out. Congratulations, you have cracked the Caesar shift code. So I've actually worked this out. So instead of trying 25 different combinations, I've only had to try perhaps two or three. Um, other good clues that you can get are from, you know, three letter words, whoops. Uh, three letter words, or one letter words, or two letter words. So, you know, words like the, you, an, it, I, a, there aren't many like that, so they can give you big clues as to what some of these words are. So that can also help up, uh, help speed up your analysis. Well, I hope you found that useful in terms of uh, practicing a little bit of uh, Caesar shift code. And perhaps you could try that out with your friends now and um, just practice your Caesar shift skills.